This is what we have to do. We have to bring street heat on the inside. We have to do it on the outside. And we have to be willing to stand up for the things that we know are necessary. All around the world, as we head into election year 2020, people are rising up against austerity, authoritarianism, broken government, and a broken economy that hurts them and the planet. So what's happening in the U.S.? We've come to Washington, D.C. to look at the way that congressional leaders and movement groups are figuring out how to collaborate going into this important presidential election of 2020. This is Laura Flanders' show, coming to you from the Progressive Strategy Summit and the streets of Washington, D.C. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. So we are here in some back room of Union Station in Washington, D.C., where the She the People organization combined with the Progressive Caucus Strategy Summit to kick off a conversation about change within the party and within the Democratic Party's relationship with social movements, the kind of conversation I haven't seen before. My old friend and colleague Amy Allison is a key, not to mention the key player in all of this. Um, Amy, what's different? What's changed? What are you doing now? Well, what's changed is uh, 2016 broke the old rules um, which rendered women of color invisible. Think about the social justice movements that are um, most impactful today. Those are led mostly by women of color. And yet, if you look at the whole ecosystem, what organizations get the money, what leaders are typically lifted up, it isn't women of color. So there's been a disconnect for a long time. I'm going to argue that the progressive movement, the left wing of the Democratic Party, was in a losing position because they just didn't get racial justice right and weren't able to speak um, the language of, and the politics of intersectionality and weren't able to say, look, um, if we do not speak to women of color, we're not going to be successful in our politics. So talk about it. You, said, you say that you are going to build a movement the like of which we have never seen. How will it be different? We're the leading a multiracial coalition that's going to... Uh, uh, make sure that our politics drive this country. And now we have the, the numbers, the vision, and now the, the courage, political courage, um, and even more importantly, a link b between movements and elected officials to actually set the agenda. Part of the way that we have this whole new group of really amazing um, uh, freshman congresswomen, like Deb Holland, Ayanna Presley, and Ilhan Omar, who were on stage with us uh, uh, tonight, is because of the, the kind of organizing that we saw that was, was different um, and focused on and centered the kind of multiracial power building that, that needed to happen. My advice to people who want to win, these guys don't get to tell us what to do anymore. The path to victory is not in convincing some Trump voter to switch teams. The path to victory is to get our people who are, agree with our politics engaged, invested, and out to vote. What's your ultimate goal? We need elected leaders who come from movement, like the women that were on that stage, who stay deeply tied to movement to give them um, power, strength, and guidance as they move forward. And that's, that, that's governance. We want to govern. And ultimately, uh, that will be the test, is whether we're able to say, to sit in Congress, in the Senate, in the state legislatures, and, and be calling the shots. It's not like we're a monolith, but we're overwhelmingly the most progressive group, and we will lead that, that political new era that I think the country's ready for. There are a lot of us, I think, who came into 2000, to, the, to the election of 2016 and realized the results of it were not business as usual that this was what some people called a five alarm fire. So my last question to you really is how you see this moment and how you think about business as usual, or if you agree that we are in this kind of a not business as usual moment. We're, we're at the end of an era. Um, the country that we live in is becoming majority people of color. And there are many, many millions of us who are insisting that our democracy become a multiracial democracy. Anything less is like apartheid, when you have a small group that controls a lot of people. And that small group is white and has wealth. So 
um, the struggles that we see across the globe um, mirror the kind of challenges that we have here. The hopeful thing is that we can unite over a common set of values. I mean, it's certainly um, what grounds my politics. I was like, heart politics is to love our own and others and um, uh, to make justice a law of the land and create a country where everyone belongs. And my greatest hope and truly the, you know, the reason I think I was born was to bring people together across race, across race and gender, um, in this, you know, as bridge people, in this language and spirit of solidarity. I get that it's not everyone and it doesn't have to be. We don't need, we don't need to change a lot of minds. We just have to find our people. And finding our people and organizing with our people is the transformation that we need right now. From Union Station, we headed over to the Progressive Strategy Summit, a gathering of progressive leaders from in and outside of Congress, to ask the question, is 2020 a politics as usual moment? And if not, what does it require? We're here at the Progressive Strategy Summit. And as always, we're hearing that this coming election, 2020, is the most important election of our lifetime. Congressman Sheila Jackson Lee from Texas's 18th. 18th district, historic, the district that Barbara Jordan held. What would she say about this moment? What do you say about this moment? Is it different from all the others? Well, her voice would be so booming. She'd say, get up and, and just do it. Um, the heart, really, of this nation is near ripped out. Um, just in a mere three years. This election should be the moment that we tell those who we have drawn to us, who came out in 2018, that we're standing alongside of you and we're not going to give up. So does this moment call for different tactics? Are we up against something different? What I would say is different tactics, yes. Different tactics is that we're not going to give up. We're not only going to fight as it relates to uh, elections, but we're not against uh, protests. We're not against letting people know uh, that they're not going to, we're not going to go away quietly. It's got to take a constant refrain that we won't take this anymore or we're standing up against it. I saw you sitting there in the front row of the She the People mm -hmm. gathering this afternoon. <laughs> what were you thinking? What were you feeling perhaps as you, as you sat there? Well, first of all, I was so proud of my colleagues. Um, I'd like to think I'm a uh, elder stateswoman <laughs> um, that is very young. But um, I was really proud of them. I'm excited about how we can craft a victory in 2020 with She the People power. And you are correct. Um, it's a new day, and I do feel that's a new day. And I feel that we should use that power. Uh, and that power should be for the good of the people, but the good of women who um, have had their share of second and third class positions in life, and particularly women of color, earning the least uh, in the jobs that others did not want, suffering indignities. I think it's beautiful to see us blossom. In addition to talking to some of the movers and shakers in the Congressional Progressive Caucus, we also caught up with some leading activists like Alicia Garza, co-founder of Black Lives Matter. It is not going to be sufficient for us to uh, just think that getting a new president in the White House and then giving power back to the Democrats is what is going to make this country better. Um, it will stop the bleeding for a little bit, but um, there is hemorrhaging happening here. I knew that Donald Trump was going to get elected, and I had no illusions about that. And the reason I had no illusions about that was because while some of us were talking about populism on the left, the right was building a populist movement that won power in this country. And I have never been mistaken uh, that this is bigger than Donald Trump. This is about a, um, a deep schism that has widened uh, to the point where uh, there has to be a different way of moving forward. We actually have to articulate who we are again. 
I don't think this is a fight between Democrats and Republicans. I don't think this is a fight between the left and the right. I think this is a fight for um, the moral center of this project that we're trying to build together. I do not think that we can just work harder and things are gonna change. I don't think that if we change who's in the White House, things are gonna change. There is so much damage that has been done um, that we are in a very different moment. And to undo the damage that has been done is going to take us at least a decade. But to be honest, things were not great before this administration took power. And so what we actually have to heal right now is people's um, complete disgust with government and its inability to meet the needs of its citizens. Um, and we also have to figure out how we solve some of the biggest problems facing America and how we do it together and how we do it in ways that um, I don't think we've really imagined yet. How do you connect your work around Black Lives Matter and police violence and the carceral state and this other work that you're talking about mm -hmm. around healing and elections and, yeah. and dealing with trauma? It's all one and the same. So uh, when Black Lives Matter first emerged, uh, it emerged around issues of state-sanctioned violence, the most visible of which was police violence. And we would constantly say, state violence takes many, many forms. It's not just about policing, but policing is the thing that we're all paying attention to because it's being captured on cell phones around the world. The state uses violence to contain and control, to quell the resistance that inequality generates. Uh, I was you know, off on a trip and I was reading about rolling blackouts that were happening. Uh, in the richest city in the nation, right? How is it that in the San Francisco Bay Area, the home of venture capital and tech capital, that people can be without power? And that is because of the increasing control of corporations over our government and the increasing relinquishment that our government gives to corporations to do whatever they want and to line their pockets and to not regulate them. All of these things are related. This deep level of economic insecurity, this deep level of material insecurity, and the rebellion that rises from that, um, state violence is used as, an, as a way to control and contain that. And if they have to kill you, they will. And do we believe it that what's at stake here are our lives? What's at stake right now um, is our actual futures. Like, the progress of the problems that are plaguing this country have accelerated since this administration took power. Um, and what's really at stake is not just the issues that I care about, but my ability to be able to make decisions over my life and the people I care about and the people I love. And I'm not willing to give that up without a fight. Mia Ives Rubley was one of the organizers of the 2016 Women's March, a disability justice activist who thinks a lot about ableism in the current context and the need to integrate disability consciousness into all that progressives do. We, we identify as progressives. We see ourselves as people of color and we also see ourselves as disabled people of color. And we want to see our politicians addressing the issues that not only just align with you know healthcare and education, which is what we always hear when people are talking about disabled people. We also want to hear about issues of police brutality. We want to hear about immigration. We want to hear um, about transportation issues. We want to hear like a wide span of issues that really affect us but have never been addressed. So I think you know one big thing is just you know getting politicians to recognize that we are a voting population and that we are an important voting bloc um, because we are 25% of the population and that's a huge percentage to be ignoring. And we're, we're also seeing some of our peers who are being shot by police because they call for mental health care, uh, mental health uh, help. And so I think what we want to see is politicians really getting a grasp on that. And I think uh, we've, we've begun picking and, and, and getting more politicians to start noticing us. And I think that's going to be a big, big, big thing um, as we continue on in the 2020. How's the Trump threat connected to the rest of your work? You know, I think people don't realize that all of these oppressions 
all coalesce and interconnect with each other, how ableism is part of white supremacy and the belief that there is a better or superior race, right? Um, and I believe that you can look throughout history and look at like when did we start identifying issues around disability? And that was around the time of understanding how the economy worked um, and how uh, there was an importance put on work. And I think understanding how um, people have been disenfranchised um, from being able to obtain work and people choosing who belongs in society and who doesn't, there becomes this fascination and this tie of like, are you human enough and are you worthy enough to be called human and and deserving of, of a presence in society um, when you're looking at disability and then you, you add on an issue of race and you add on all of these other issues um, it's all tied in together on who who is worthwhile in, in talking about who deserves what in society. So is it just about getting Trump out of the White House? No, no. If we get somebody like, say, Joe Biden, or we get somebody who who isn't, you know, you know, just wants to go back to sort of what we have had in the past, are people gonna still stick up for us? You know, like people, kids were getting, being, I mean, people were getting caged long before President Trump came into office. And and there wasn't a lot of outcry. You know, like people like Obama continued policies that were, were hurtful to a lot of communities. And so I think there is a big fear that people just are so focused on Trump that they're not looking at like a, a lot of these societal structures that have continued these issues, and yeah, sure, Trump has sort of used that as a way to, to get what he wants, but if we don't demolish those systems and rebuild something new, we're just gonna run back into the same issue and we'll have somebody 10, 15 years from now doing the same exact things, caging people. So the work goes on. Yeah, of course. So it's not just members of Congress and social movement groups who are feeling an urgency here in Washington right across town at the Capitol, actress and activist Jane Fonda has been doing weekly vigils and arrests she calls Fire Drill Fridays for the climate. I caught up with her in a week focused on oceans. Hey, we can do this. We really can. It may be a little inconvenient, but it's not as inconvenient as fires and floods and mass migration and droughts and starvation, that's inconvenient. We're holding, uh, I've been working with Greenpeace and a number of other environmental organizations to, to hold these fire drill Fridays. Greta says, our house is on fire, we have to behave like it is, so we're having fire drill Fridays. We have to do everything we can now. This is the time. We only have 11 years. Leave our comfort zone and become more, more of an activist. The scientists now say that's what we need. We need massive numbers of people in the streets. To so force. not just vote, but a whole lot more. But, well, we have to vote. We have to vote for the climate. We have to vote for people that are not moderate, people who really understand that this is a time when it's too late for moderation, when we have to do something as brave as a Green New Deal. And then we have to stay in the streets to hold their feet to the fire. We can't just elect them and then go away. No matter how good they are, we have to keep pressuring with growing numbers and, if necessary, shut the government down. What do we want? When do we want it? Now. What do we want? When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Well, anyone who has children or grandchildren needs to be worried about this because we're running out of time to deal with food, water, clean air. We, I feel like our elected officials are doing nothing to stop climate change, and yet it's an existential threat, and now is the last moment. To, now is the 11th hour for us to take action. The climate crisis is having impacts now, 
right now while we're speaking, there's much stronger wildfires and we're having routine blackouts in the United States of America and in one of the richest parts of the country in California. You know, so this is a crisis that affects everyone. We have a million species out of about 8 million on Earth who are predicted to go extinct. You know, so this is an enormous crisis. We've done everything we're told we're supposed to to make change in a democratic society. None of it's worked, so we got to resort to civil disobedience. So here we are taking the street. So we're live here at the Fire Drill Fridays. And I don't know about you, but I was super moved by a lot of what we heard this morning. Not just the idea that this isn't business as usual, we know that, but that this is really a matter of changing our relationship to the natural world and to one another. So I think I'm gonna go get arrested because we do have to put our bodies on the line and our actions have to reflect our words. So let's go join Ted and Jane on the steps. While I was being processed by the Capitol Police along with about 30 other demonstrators, Laura Flanders show creative director Matt Colicello interviewed Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, about her take on what's called for now. Can you talk about right now and what this moment requires of us? Is this a business as usual moment? No, no, so far from that. I mean, this is, I think, one of the most important moments in our history. And um, when you think about all of the things that are happening, we are in the midst of a constitutional crisis, first of all, with a president who is abusing the power of the Oval Office that is completely disregarding Congress and the at least co-equal nature of our branches of government. And um, sort of at the same time that that really difficult stuff is all happening, we have the most progressive, the most diverse, House of Representatives in the history of Congress. And that is making a difference. When you have that kind of diversity, what you start to see is people responding to government in a very different way, and also a boldness of proposals, structural reforms, because so many of these diverse members of Congress come from really seeing the trauma on the ground of all of the working people, white, black, and brown, who are suffering. So it's a moment, uh, you know, as an organizer for 20 years before coming to Congress, mm. I like to say that strength emerges in times of crisis. And um, that is, I think, what you see, a movement that is unifying, a movement that is um, pushing for bold change that will mm. actually reform some of these deeply embedded problems that we have, institutionalized racism, sexism, classism, and I think pushing for something very different. How do we bring our movements into the, the Democratic Party or into government in general? Well, I mean, we're here, you know, and, and the Progressive Caucus is a perfect example of this. We have a hundred, uh, it's either a hundred or a hundred and one members um, in the House that are part of the Progressive Caucus. That's 40% of the entire Democratic Caucus. But more than that, there are the movements that support this work. It's important to get Trump out. However, that doesn't fix the problem. So structural reforms that we need, we need to take on white supremacy, we need to take on corporate supremacy, and we need to take on individual supremacy. And, and then of course, climate. We need to make sure that we are addressing the urgent crisis of climate, which by the way, has all three of those supremacies that I mentioned tied right into why we are not making progress on, on climate. Can you just talk a little bit about what it has been like since 2016 to be in this, this extended moment of crisis in our country, yeah. but also to be part of this cultural shift towards making the Democratic Party more progressive. Yeah, well, I never wanted to be in office. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was an activist on the outside and I was pretty skeptical of elected officials, but I had this, I suddenly realized that we are seeding, giving up this important space for organizing. And um, when I was arrested right here in, in D.C. leading a, a, um, a huge uh, civil disobedience protest with 100 women, I realized that we have been pushing and pushing and pushing from the outside, but why aren't we on the inside? Why do we have to push so hard to get our ideas taken seriously? And maybe what we needed to do was come on the inside and change the whole way that we think about organizing so that there isn't even an inside or outside, but that we have organizers populating 
all the most powerful platforms that we need to push for our progressive policies. Yeah. I've tried to bring those principles to the work I do, how I craft a bill. Um, we bring our movement partners into the room to craft the bill. Mm. Um, how we organize protests or what happens when there's a horrible thing, like when I heard about the family separations and I was the first member of Congress to go into a federal prison and working with movement allies within three weeks we turned out half a million people into the streets. This is what we have to do. We have to bring street heat on the inside. We have to do it on the outside. And we have to be willing to stand up for the things that we know are necessary. And not just, not just go along with the things that seem possible right now. Our job always as activists and organizers is to push the boundaries of what's seen as possible. And now we get to do it from the inside as well. Yes. Street heat on the inside. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for chatting with us. Thank really you. It's great it. to be with you. <laughs> so it has to be said that the Progressive Caucus only makes up about 40% of the Democrats in Congress. What power do they wield? Well, that'll depend a lot on their relationship with the movement groups that they want to build connection with when they have meetings like this one. Will they be able to do politics differently in 2020? We'll find out. But in the meantime, you can be sure there's going to be more action happening in the streets and more people turning up the heat, both where they live and here in Washington.